welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 275th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today we're going to talk about emotional freedom and really learning how to cultivate this skill that will completely transform our lives in a way that we may not have thought was possible. And then today's Petit Plaisir is going to offer a respite for those of us in North America who may be itching for spring to arrive Knowing we still have, depending on where you live, a month, two months, if you're here in Bend, maybe three, until the blooms start to share and introduce themselves to us. I think you'll enjoy it. I know I have been, and um, no matter where you call home um, throughout our globe, I have a feeling you'll enjoy it as well. But that will come at the end of today's episode. I'm going to share with you today 34 ways to attain emotional freedom and cultivate more joy of living. Let's get into today's episode. I want to begin with a quote from the book that inspired today's episode, a book that I caught sight of just about the beginning of the new year, and I quickly ordered it and in about a weekend read it. I just found it very helpful, very detailed, and pointed about exactly the tools one might need to attain emotional freedom. This is from Dr. Judith Orloff's best-selling book, Emotional Freedom, Liberate Yourself from Negative Emotions and Transform Your Life. Quote, emotional freedom is a homecoming to your own heart and fullest power. It salutes authenticity, not conforming to someone else's notion of what to feel or how to be. I want to share with you four different scenarios. Maybe some of them you relate to, maybe some of them you know but no longer relate to, maybe all of them you know. The middle of the night, before you can fall asleep or early morning thoughts that swirl and fuel agitation, worry, and fear preventing you from falling asleep. Scenario two, the feeling of being lonely and falling prey to the purport of society that the simple solution is to find someone to be romantically involved with. Scenario number three, ratcheted chronic anxiety that cements you from pursuing something new or chasing your dreams or simply enjoying your everyday life. Scenario four, an assumed negative default in perspective when it comes to the world, the future, especially your future, and what is actually possible no matter what your age. In sharing each of these scenarios, maybe you most strongly identified with one of them, or maybe none of them spoke to you, but moments of one or two rear their heads in your life when your energy is depleted or life temporarily becomes exhausting. And hopefully, maybe you recognize your former self in one or more of these and now are able to celebrate having broken free of the counterproductive emotional patterns that were learned and accepted as, quote, how life will be. Wherever you find yourself on the continuum of learning the skills of attaining emotional freedom, after listening to today's episode, you will have a clear path forward for identifying with a latter description of celebrating where you were, but no longer being there and setting yourself free. I picked up Dr. Judith Orloff's book, as I mentioned at the beginning of the year, and the reason was I, I needed it. I needed it. I knew the skills I needed to improve the quality of my emotional life were lacking, but I did not know what they were or if I had a sense of them, how to even strengthen them. So I was drawn to this book and I picked it up. And very quickly, the definition that she ascribes to emotional freedom is just this. Increasing your ability to love by cultivating positive emotions and being able to compassionately witness and transform negative ones, whether they're yours or another's. Choosing to become emotionally free is entirely the choice of us, the individual. Whether healthy emotional patterns were modeled by your parents or not, you can learn them, apply them, and then shift how you engage with the world, how you experience the world, and and how you move forward and elevate the quality of your life experience. 
before I dive into the 34 ways to attain emotional freedom, I want to share with you the benefits of setting yourself free emotionally, as described in Dr. Orloff's book. Here we go. Liberation from fear. Navigate adversity without going on the attack or losing your cool or being derailed by it. Choose to respond constructively rather than relinquishing your command of the situation whenever your buttons are pushed. Communicate more successfully and gain more confidence in yourself and empathy for others. You will no longer feel disconnected or lonely. You will feel more comfortable in your own skin. You will be able to be part of nurturing relationships. You will discover more contentment. You will become more flexible with life. You will begin to own the moment, no matter whom or what you are facing. You will be more, quote, fiercely alive. And you will attain liberation from the compulsive tyranny of negative emotions, such as worry and anger, so you can choose more joy. And I've listed these because I think it's important to understand why attaining certain skills are worth our while because we're busy and we may think we've got it figured out and things are working okay, but they can be even better. And this is a skill that any of us can learn. And I'd like to share with you the points for me spoke to me and also were ones I felt this audience would appreciate. And I've listed them and I will talk about each of them as we go through the episode today. To do the homework of learning the skill or any skill, the steady and consistent exercises to welcoming the emotional freedom you seek in your everyday life is going to take time, but we need to know what we need to do so that we can see eventually reach the change we want to see. So as I mentioned, these are all being inspired by the book, Emotional Freedom, but I'm just covering the surface and I highly recommend reading and keeping as a resource this book as you incorporate and habituate these new practices that can improve the quality of your everyday life and cultivate more joy. But let's get into today's list. Number one, discover your emotional patterns. Know thyself. What emotional type do you most define yourself as? There are four that she shares in her book in chapter four in great detail. The intellectual, the empath, the rock, and the gusher. And she breaks down the emotional patterns, shares the tendencies, their strengths, their drawbacks, and more importantly, shares how to strike a balance to welcome the good qualities of whatever emotional pattern you exhibit and letting go of the unhelpful emotional patterns. So if nothing else, this this is worth reading and then reading again (laughs) to fully absorb it, understanding which one you are. Now, most of us will probably find ourselves in two or more of these, but we'll probably have a predominant one um, if we have never looked at this before, if we've never done the homework before. And once we figure out the strengths of what our predominant nature is or or personality is, um, and I think it's temperament, that's my argument, that it's something that's innate within us, But we can also see that there are drawbacks in in each of these and to recognize them, be consciously aware of them. And there's where we gain the knowledge about ourselves. So that's the most important one as we begin with regards to knowledge. So that will direct where we're going to go along this journey of gaining emotional freedom. Number one is discover your emotional patterns. Know thyself. Number two, take charge of who you want to be. Begin by understanding how you were nurtured as a child. And as you grew into an adult and even into your adult years regarding how you were raised by your parents and continue to interact with them, there were most likely strengths and weaknesses by both your parents. Dr. Orloff suggests observing each with an objective perspective as absolutely much as possible for the purpose of gaining self-knowledge of what have become positive and as well as unproductive ways of of you emotionally engaging with the world. This is not a practice that you have to share with your parents, and you shouldn't. This is something about you to know yourself better, to understand yourself better. Now, once you have done this, move forward consciously. Quote, consciousness is the path to freedom, end quote. Acquiring self-knowledge will lift the fog, as she describes it, and show you the way to clear blue skies of clearly, concretely knowing what you want to change, and why you want to change it. So as we begin this list of items of how to become emotionally free, it really begins with knowledge and knowledge of thyself, knowing who we sincerely are, how we came to be where we are, and what it is that we're doing that's helpful and what's not helpful. Number three, seek calm and eliminate stress. One of these enhances your overall health. 
yes, your physical health especially, and the other depletes and destructs it. No doubt you know immediately which one does which. Here are a few simple ways to welcome more calm practices into your everyday routine. Experiment and partake in laughter. Exercise. Meditate. Understand the power of breathing. And then just simply do anything that makes you feel loved. So number three is seek and cultivate more calmness into your life or tranquility. And then do all that you can to eliminate the stress. At the very least, do it for your health, longevity, and quality of life. Number four, resist negativity and turn toward and amplify the positive. Becoming emotionally free is a choice by each of us. So it requires that we act and thereby think differently. Actions include what and how we speak. The words we utter and the tone in which we utter them matter immensely and absolutely. We have control over these two qualities of speech. Orloff explains how words contain energy and we are transferring that energy when we speak and how when we say something supposedly positive or kind in theory is entirely accepted and is received with love. Or if what we're saying is not accepted as positive, even though what the words are, but not the tone, there can be a disbelief or a cause we may cause hurt. And this is all determined by the tone in which we speak those words. Here's a quote to contemplate. Words impart energy that can be enlivening or malignant. This is true whether you direct words to yourself or others. So number four is to understand the power of the words we say, but also how we say them. Not only to others and how we communicate, but also in our head to ourselves when things maybe aren't going the way we think they should and how we bolster ourselves up or the opposite. And hopefully we aren't doing the opposite, but if we are, just understand that we're not feeding ourselves well. Number five, pay attention to your physical reaction around others. Ultimately, we, as we've talked about many times before on this podcast, we are social creatures, but it's imperative that we are aware of what type of people we surround ourselves with. So to determine if the people you either choose to be around or have to be around or are newly introduced to, making sure that they bring positive energy into your life is imperative. So observe your physical response to them when you're right, when you're right there with them in real life, right there in person. So having to do with how someone speaks to you, when they do speak to you, observe, Dr. Orloff suggests, your physical reaction with your body instead of how your brain processes the actual words. Let your physical responses guide you to help you determine who to continue to spend time around and who to walk away from. Here's an example. You know that charmer who says the sweetest compliments, whether it's at work or in your personal life. He says it or she says it with a smile, but it causes your body to physically cringe each time. Yep, that may be a sign that negative energy is coming your way. The words may not be actual negative, but it's the tone. It's the energy, perhaps. Walking away would be probably be the best idea in this situation. So that's number five. Pay attention to your physical reaction around others. Number six, use breathing practices to calm and or quiet a hyperactive mind. Now, we talked about the four different emotional patterns. And if you discover that you identify more with the intellect emotional pattern, your mind is very busy. It is busy planning, learning, inquiring, planning some more, and trying to figure out how to get it all done. However, when this happens, before we can figure out how to fall asleep or need to fall back asleep... This is when we can define the mind as in a hyperactive state, and it is not emotionally helpful. Simply breathe. Get out of your head and breathe. And appreciate the sensation of breath. When you take it in through your nose and let it out through your mouth. This is a very simplified version of meditation, but at the core, it's about paying attention to your breath You're not necessarily turning off your brain. You're just giving it a break to relax so that you're focused on your breathing. Count your breaths if that helps. I have done this a handful of times when I couldn't fall asleep. And I will literally just lay down. I'm in bed trying to fall asleep. This doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, because I've gotten better at this. But it used to be pretty, pretty, it was much more consistent or much more regular. And I will just, in my head, count to four or six 
in my intake. And four or six as I release the breath. And if I'm really tired, this will turn my brain off in the best possible way. And I will be asleep before I realize it. It sounds too simple, but it can work. Number seven, exercise. Regularly, aerobically, but also with strengthening and flexibility activities incorporating, incorporated throughout the week. Exercise requires you to be present, to be paying attention to your body, to be paying attention to your surroundings, how you're stepping, how you're holding that pose. It helps you get out of your head and it focuses you on what you're doing. And this is a great exercise to find the balance if you're someone who is very cerebral, cerebral and always in their head. Number eight, engage with others first with empathy and then secondly with your head what we mean by this is to connect with people. Say someone comes up to you and they're upset about something and they're trying, maybe you're the, you're the worker and they're the, the customer. Relate to them somehow. Connect with them emotionally. Empathize based on what they've shared with you so that they begin to trust you, but also so that you can notice and recognize in your own mind, I am talking to a human. I may just have been, you know, verbally assaulted, or I may have been verbally, I I might feel that negative energy coming at me. But when you show compassion, you're more likely to calm the situation down. And that comes from being empathetic. But then you do need to use your head and you need to be logical and reasonable about solutions. And that too will calm them down because they have initially started to trust you unconsciously, perhaps, but it's how you're treating them initially. So that's number eight, engage first with empathy. And secondly, with your head. Number nine, how to handle that unwanted situation. And what we mean by this is after the fact, you're all, something's happened, you didn't want it to happen, you're home or you're on your way home from work or you're leaving the situation and you're just agitated and your, your body's just tense, the adrenaline's running and you're just upset by how things went. Whether you did your best or you knew you could have done better or whatever it is, this is after the fact. This is not in the moment. This is after the fact. First, think. Think all of the details through first and do it once and do it well. In so doing, you are making sure you do not react, which would be, which would be your emotions taking over and potentially throwing you into a, quote, fizzy state, as she calls it. So how do you think first when it's just seemingly natural to be emotional and upset and distraught and just all, as she says, fizzy? To recognize that that is going to happen, but then to stop that. By thinking. So when we find that balance of when to think and when to use our emotions, this is emotional freedom because we now have the steering wheel. So how do you do this think first thing? Well, you use positive self-talk, she suggests, and then logic as well to become grounded. Then take some deep breaths. Do not take on the emotions of others. That person was angry. They were upset. We don't know everything about the context maybe in this particular moment, but we could see that they were clearly angry. You can, in that moment, she says, still be loving and not take on their emotions. You do not have to feel what they are emoting. But recognizing that you need to think first before you emotionally react so that instead you will respond well when you are ready and able is vital. It puts, again, you in the driver's seat of your emotions. That's number nine. Number 10, allow regular quiet time for emotional decompression. This is for emotional um, patterns that identify with the empath um, pattern, especially, but everyone to be aware of this need to emotionally decompress regularly throughout the day. This could be dependent upon your workspace. This could be going into your office for five minutes, no appointments, no phone, looking out on nature, if you have the opportunity to view nature, maybe just closing your eyes, sitting down, doing a quick meditation session. Maybe it's putting on some great music if you haven't been able to do that all day and know that there's not going to be any interruptions for five to ten minutes. Or going on a quick walk around the building or if there's a park nearby, taking a quick walk on your lunch break. Something that allows you to step away and not be emotionally stimulated beyond your internal self. And thus you can keep yourself calm because you have control over your emotions. Number 11, honor your empathetic needs. Number one, 
I'm going to share three different ways that you can honor your empathetic needs. And again, this is more um, tailored to the empath. So if you're a highly sensitive person, you're probably absolutely going to identify with the empath um, emotional pattern. Um, But even if you're not, again, this is something to be aware of. Simply understand what you need to find this balance. An example might be reminding yourself that no is absolutely enough of a response to a question about your time, your ability to do something, etc. Also, just this self-knowledge is going to be very helpful in this situation. Understand what max socializing time is for you. If especially, you know, different times of the day, different times of the week, different times of the year, depending on your job and, and life responsibilities. Here's a perfect example. During the school year, Friday night, and I've shared this many times before, Friday night, I need to decompress for the entire evening. I very rarely will go out Friday evening because I am emotionally exhausted. doesn't mean anything bad happened, but because I'm teaching during the school year, I'm exhausted. But during the summer, not the case. Friday, I'll go. I'll go out. I'll have fun. I'll travel. And I'll get out of town, whatever. I have so much more emotionally, emotional energy. And I just, knowing the difference, knowing what you need, why you need it. And the last one of an idea with regards to honoring your empathetic needs, and I really like this one, is if you need to take a separate car so that you can return when you are emotionally ready to leave any kind of event or party or gathering, don't feel guilty for taking your own car. You need this. Honor that. Similarly, if you need your own space when you're visiting family on the holidays or when traveling, honor your need by reserving a nearby Airbnb or reserving your own room. I had a a, a reader, a listener, write to me over the holidays this past year and share with me exactly this. She honored what she needed. And while she wanted to spend time with her family and see her family during the holidays, and she did, she also knew what she needed to be able to enjoy them. And so she... um, She rented a hotel room, if I'm not mistaken, but her own space so that she could enjoy it even more. And I appreciated her sharing that because um, that's not not something to feel guilty about, even if someone doesn't understand. This is you knowing yourself and what you need, communicating that calmly and respectfully, but setting the boundary and honoring that for yourself. That's number 11. Honor your empathetic needs. Number 12. Engage with life. If you have been hurt or if you have seen yourself as the rock on the emotional patterns list, engaging with life will initially be uncomfortable or even foreign to you. However, keep in mind what Brene Brown teaches, and that is that vulnerability is needed in order to sincerely connect and have those relationships that you seek. But as I share in episode 126, do not forget to partner vulnerability with setting healthy boundaries. This plays into the one we just talked about with honoring your needs. Number 11, you need to know what it is that you need to thrive. And that is going to play into knowing where your boundaries need to be set so that you can be vulnerable and not feel that you're going to be walked over, overwhelmed or engulfed. So that's number 12. And that's how you can then engage in life. Number 13 is simple daily task. Practice this on everyday basis. Very simple. Express one feeling a day in your journal. Why? To acknowledge honestly how you are feeling and when you are ready to examine the why. Understanding what triggers you, what prompts you to feel certain things, whether they're negative or positive. When you partake in this daily practice, you will become more knowledgeable of yourself, but also improve how to better communicate how you feel and why to others that you are in relationships with. Even better, you'll begin to see the emotions are temporary, and that is helpful to keep in mind as well. When we see upon reflection on this day, we were angry, and here's why. And the next day, we were more at ease. And here's why we can then see patterns and connections and triggers and prompts. But then we can also see that emotions change. Wow, look at that difference in a day or two days or a week. And that should bring you comfort. And also, you may say, well, but I liked feeling that way. Well, then it reminds you to savor those moments even more. Number 13. That's a simple daily task. Express one feeling a day in your journal. Number 14. If you are a gusher on that list of emotional patterns, to kind of quell this, because that's not always healthy as far as the always expressing without thinking before you speak, 
She suggests, before seeking advice or support, follow these steps to gain more emotional freedom. First, center your feelings by defining the upset, what prompted you to feel as you do. Then answer the question, how does this make you feel? Then work with your feelings, clear the emotion, move through it, exhale the negativity, use positive self-talk, and then tune into your intuition to find the solution. I've included on this particular number on the list a detailed post I, that, that I wrote a couple years ago about intuition, when to trust it and when to ignore it. So if you want to try to understand more about tuition and our intuition, go ahead and take a look at that link. And that's in the show notes. It's so simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 275. Moving on to number 15, extricate the emotional vampires from your life. Sounds simple and it can be eventually, but here we go. Let's talk about why this is important. Within the book, you'll find a list of all the different types of emotional vampires. And it was helpful for me um, to see all of their different characteristics. And I will admit, honestly, that I saw my older self in some of these descriptors. And I didn't like seeing that, but I can acknowledge that, oh my, yeah. Just as important as it is to sweep out the emotional vampires from our own lives so other people we also do not want to be one of these emotional vampires to others. Even if the people keep, keep us in our lives, they probably should have set a boundary. They probably should have said something, but we can't control the people. And we didn't recognize it, obviously, of what we're doing. So it's important that we evaluate the list for both sides, ourselves and those that are in our lives. Back to the extrication of these emotional vampires. It entails clear and calm communication, as well as setting boundaries. Once you recognize how they make you physically feel, remember to return to point five, recognizing or identifying how someone makes you feel your immediate responses, find your voice, set your boundaries, and walk away to seek other nurturing individuals to spend time with. So that's number 15. Extricate emotional vampires from your life. Number 16, set limits. It's important to repeat what has already been mentioned twice thus far in today's episode, but it, it needs to be said, set boundaries. In episode 126, I shared in detail how to do that, how to set boundaries and why it's so important. Our emotional well-being depends upon this if we want to have healthy relationships. And if you haven't done this in the past, it's going to be hard initially, but it's not impossible and it gets easier with every time you do it. Number 16, again, is set limits. Number 17, be solution-oriented. Previously here on the podcast and on the blog, um, it has been shared that complaining about something you dislike or someone you dislike is only a positive contribution to our lives and the lives of others if we are also accompanying the complaint with a sincere solution. So otherwise, let it go. Don't complain and move forward. This is a good check. So when you are in a conversation and you're talking and you have this urge or this habit of just complaining about something to check and say, am I offering a solution? Is this beneficial to share in some way that I can then provide a solution? And if not, don't say it or say something else that is solution oriented. So that's number 17. So we just went through the first half of the list of 34 ways to gain emotional freedom. I'm going to take a quick one minute break and I'll be right back with the rest of today's list and this week's Petite Pizier. <music> Welcome back. Number 18, understand that fear is a form of stress and then move beyond your fears. Dr. Orloff explains in biological detail the body's physical response to fear, and it is not good for our health. Be sure to check out pages 149 to 152. 
If you are someone who catastrophizes the future, expects the worst in situations, has fearful thoughts that keep you up at night, is afraid to speak up or go for what you want, then you are letting fear play a significant and consequently harmful role in your overall life. In other words, you are welcoming more stress into your life that need not be present. Move beyond your fears, not by avoiding them, but rather by, quote, facing them in a productive way. Here's a quote to contemplate. Courage requires the presence of adversity. In fact, no fear, no courage. Without something to overcome, there's no biological push to be brave or conquer negativity. True evolutionary milestones. So how do you move beyond your fear? Here are four ideas. First one, avoid people who reinforce your fear. Okay. Second one, avoid violent media, in the news, arguments, or other scenarios that cause you stress. Immerse yourself in hot water immediately when the stress becomes too much and you have access to a bath. Soak in that bath and you will help relax muscular tension quickly. And then another physical activity is simply to practice breathing. This is why the emotional decompression regularly, th regularly throughout the day is a good habit to get into because it it gives you that release. It gives you that out. It provides that balance that maybe you don't have because you don't have control over other people in your daily life with the work or personal, whatever it may be. So number 18 is to understand that fear is stress and then move beyond it proactively. Number 19, seek out and remain close to emotional nurturers. So one of the ways to move past fear productively is just on the flip side of the last point we just talked about, number 18, instead of being with people who reinforce your fear, gravitate toward people that create calm, that are positive, that are not emotional vampires, that nurture positive emotions. Number 20, identify the fears you'd like to be free from and then identify their triggers. To return to the first item on our list today, self-knowledge is the fundamental component in emotional freedom. We gain clarity when we investigate ourselves and our reasons for feeling the emotions that arise seemingly out of our control. When we can identify the trigger, we can then successfully change it or eliminate it altogether. So again, knowledge is power. Number 21, quote, we attract what we are. Here's a quote to ponder. A basic law of emotional energy is that we attract who we are. Fear attracts fear. Courage attracts courage. If you want positivity coming at you, you've got to generate it. This influences which people and events keep appearing in your life. So think about that for a moment, either in your life right now or in the past. Those, those relationships, those events, the scenarios that you gravitated toward. Maybe now you have more clarity in the positive or negative reasons why you did that. This is a good practice to do to gain that self-knowledge that is all important to attaining emotional freedom. Number 22, stay optimistic despite fear. Regardless of what goes on in your life, wanted or unwanted, be mindful of your response. In other words, do not react. Take a breath or take a beat before speaking or taking action. When a fear arises, saying in your head that you won't be able to accomplish what you've set before yourself to achieve, focus on even the smallest victories. You're still trying. You still care. You're still going to keep going after it. When you make a habit of positive, mindful response, eventually it becomes a track in your mind in the right possible ways. And when it becomes a track, it then has become your default to not be thwarted by fear, but to courageously face whatever it is that you initially would be fearful of and address it in a proactive way so you can move beyond it. So that's number 22, stay optimistic despite fear. Number 23, continue to grow into self-awareness. Each of us is continuing to change as we are dynamic creatures, whether we want to be or not. In actuality, it is a good characteristic that we are dynamic because it means we have an opportunity to grow. As we are continually growing, should we choose to, that means we have to continue to be aware of ourselves, our needs, emotional responses, etc., and not become complacent. In other words, as the book shares, our life truly is our career. It takes effort, but such effort pays many positive dividends. So that's number 23. Continue to grow into self-awareness. 24. Overcome frustration with patience. 
One of the biggest roadblocks to emotional freedom is frustration. I've written a detailed post on patience and the benefits of it, and I've provided that link in the show notes under number 24. But here's a quote from the book to give you an idea of why embracing patience is a great idea. Making a more deliberate choice to delay instant gratification and cultivate patience will help you achieve emotional freedom, have faith in yourself, and your destiny. End quote. So number 24 is overcome frustration with patience. 25, let friendships and romances develop slowly. Why? In order to cultivate trust or to determine if someone is trustworthy. Simple and doable. 26, find and welcome nurturing sources into your daily life. Nurturing sources need not only be people. Nurturing sources exist within and outside of ourselves. Anything that provides a sense of home is a nurturing source. So number 26 is find and welcome nurturing sources into your daily life. 27, foster positive human contact or community. When you engage with others at work, your personal life, or in your neighborhood, online even, choose to make it a positive exchange. Again, you want to give the world what you ultimately want to see and experience yourself. I have no doubt you want to see peace. You want to see calm, tranquility. You want to see positive engagement. You want to see excitement, joy, love, whatever it is, kindness. So put that out there. It sounds simple, and it's really so out of our control. But this is the part that's not. This is the part that is in our control, and we might as well give it a shot. Number 28, learn the power and skill of meditating. I know I've mentioned meditation before earlier in this list, but I think it bears repeating because it is powerful and it is important to being able to calm our mind, not turn it off as we've talked about before. That's a misconception, but being able to be an objective observer of our mind and I break it all down for you in a post that I wrote in 2014, Why Not Meditate? And I provide the links on today's show notes. So number 28 is learn the power and skill of meditating. Number 29, practice gratitude. Something that I have enjoyed sharing each month is my What Made Me Smile post. And I look forward to adding to this list as the, as the month unfolds. And I keep a list inside my, my planner and inside my journals. And then I eventually will share a few of them on um, the end of the month, on the last Wednesday of every month. This is how or one way I practice gratitude. And however you practice gratitude, just make it a daily journal. Or it could be through prayer or by sending thank you notes or any action that asks of you to reflect and see all that is going well in your life. Make this a regular practice and it will begin to shift your focus. We attract what we are. And if we are grateful, we will begin to see even more of which to be grateful for. So that's 29. Practice gratitude. 30. Listen to your intuition. But first, understand what intuition is and what it is not. I'll provide a link to help you dive deeply into that, as I mentioned earlier in today's episode. Once you can accurately define what your intuition is, then you have a powerful skill in your arsenal to enable you to elevate your everyday life due to the choices you will make. So number 30 is, yes, intuition should play a role on your journey to emotional freedom. Number 31 redefine the traditional paradigm for coupling. Communicate what energetic preferences and boundaries you need in a relationship so that you are not emotionally engulfed from how you live together to how much time you spend together to sleeping arrangements to the space you need. If you are an empath, especially, you may deeply want a relationship, but fear based on past experiences that you will not be safe due to all of the energy and emotion of others that you will absorb. Due to this, you have either acquiesced and let yourself become engulfed or spoken up ineffectively and then been berated for being difficult or cold. Neither of these things are true. And effectively communicating and more importantly, being with a person who is open to understanding you is the key to being part of a healthy, nurturing relationship. I really appreciated chapter eight and she talked, and this is a chapter where she talks about this being aware of what you need in a relationship and how a relationship can be a very positive thing in our lives. We're talking romantic relationship, but it needs these particular skills from us and thus our partner to respect these, um, these needs as well. And she breaks this down in great detail in chapter eight. 
Number 32, take time for solitude regularly. Here is a quote to ponder. Solving loneliness involves connecting to yourself as well as others. That's why it's vital to find your own right rhythm of worldly involvement and solitude. Honor the time you need for yourself. Every one of us will need more or less than the next person, but honor what you need. 33. Acknowledge and celebrate current healthy connections. As mentioned in number 26, not all healthy connections will involve other humans. It could be in Mother Nature that you find a healthy connection. So in whether you're hiking or gardening or simply being outside, that is a positive healthy connection to celebrate. It could also be that you enjoy spending time with animals or you luxuriate in your thoughtfully curated home. These and many more are healthy connections. Invest in them, savor them, and do not let others dismiss the value that these connections have in your life to make you feel connected and to make you feel whole. When we invest in these types of connections, we realize the power of having a space that feels as though we're at home, if it's our home, So that's number 33, acknowledge and celebrate your current healthy connections. And last but not least, number 34, strengthen the relationship you have with yourself. It's the most important one you will ever have. In other words, invest in understanding how to welcome emotional freedom into your life. It will take time and it will make you uncomfortable for a short duration. But that is the way with change. It is uncomfortable because it's stretching us. So 34 is to honor and value the relationship you have with yourself. Take the time to, to get to know yourself. Really dive deep. It's a con- constant and ongoing process, but it gets easier the more you know about yourself as you move through life in every chapter that you're going to live. In our personal life toolbox, as I share in detail in my second book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, Making Your Every Days Extraordinary and Becoming Your Best Self, our toolbox is filled with sp- with both strengths and skills. Strengths are innate. And when we choose to strengthen these talents, we share with the world a unique gift that only we can offer. The skills are tools any one of us can learn and apply to our lives to elevate the overall quality. Emotional intelligence is discussed in detail in my book, which is why today I want to talk even more in depth about why emotional freedom is a skill of great benefit to us and those in our life. Personally, upon reading Dr. Judith Orloff's book, I had many aha moments, many validation moments, and many clarity of how to proceed moments. And as it happens on many occasions here on the blog and the podcast, I wanted to share what I learned in hopes that you too will find great value for this skill in your life as you continue to grow and create an everyday that truly delights you. I'll provide a link to this entire list on the show notes, the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 275. And I'll be right back with this week's Petit Plaisir. This week's Petit Plaisir is Monty Don's American Garden series. This series has been on BBC Two since the beginning of this new year's 2020. And there are three episodes, each of an hour length, where he goes around the United States and shows, he even showed me a handful of gardens and places I had never heard of. For example, DuPont's Gardens in Longwood, Pennsylvania. I had no idea that existed. But what I have been enjoying about this, just as I enjoyed last year's Petit Plaisir when I talked about Monty's, um, Don's um, French Garden Series and his Italian Garden Series, which I both, I highly recommend both, is that. It's his insights and his conversations and his appreciation for gardening that bring each of these spaces into more technicolor appreciation on my part. Um, the, the videography is lovely. His crew does a wonderful job. And um, in the first episode alone, he'll travel um, up into the northeastern part of the country. Um, he then will travel to the southwest region of the country in episode two and to California. But he'll also travel to Washington, D.C. and to Florida um, and to Arizona. Um, there's just so I guess Arizona is part of the southwest. My apologies. But there's so many different places across this country 
that he brings to our attention. And the first episode really focuses on the pioneering spirit and how that is embodied and displayed in so many different ways in gardens in America. Um, I appreciated it being an American, getting some history. Um, but I also got to see different parts that I didn't know about and, um, that aren't that far away from me. Uh, and also how they're inspired some of these gardens by their travels abroad to Europe. Um, because I know many of us love traveling to Europe or if not live there. And so this idea, idea of how we can bring what we love back when it works well. And, um, and in fact, it really does speak to what a great garden is all about. And so I want to share with you a quote from the end of the first episode where he has just been in a garden in, um, Northern New Jersey. Um, I won't share too much more about it just because I think it's, you'll find this garden fascinating, but all of them I found fascinating one way or another. And Monty talks with regards to this particular garden, It's a garden that expresses one man's love and passion and a very personal relationship with this space. And that, of course, is the real secret of all great gardens. If nothing else, this is going to inspire my fellow gardeners um, to get even more excited for the spring and summer to come. And if you already have the ability to have your fingers in the dirt, oh, it will really get you going and get you excited. So this is Monty Don's American Gardens. There are three episodes. They originally aired on BBC Two. And they were premiered in January, beginning of January 2020. You can actually watch all the episodes online if you don't have access to BBC Two. I found one and three on YouTube, and then I found the second one on dailymotion.com um, completely for free. So uh, if uh, you want to check them out, that's where you can find them no matter where you call home. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you very much for tuning in. Stop by next Monday for a brand new episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up my latest book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, Making Your Every Days Extraordinary and Discovering Your Best Self, now available on Audible and wherever audiobooks are sold, as well as in paperback and ebook versions. You can also pick up my first book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide, which is also available in paperback, ebook, and as an audiobook as well. To stay caught up on the most recent episodes of the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your weekend, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's free weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox each Friday to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or cup of morning coffee. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.